Welcome to this Halloween special. Programming is an art form, almost like magic. And just like magic, there is a darker side to the craft. So sit comfortably, grab a copy of The Art of Computer Programming for safety, and join me as I go down a recursive rabbit hole, looking at some of the more terrifying examples of how to write code. This isn't just a list of weird esoteric languages nobody's heard of. I've found some actual examples of programming that will make you wonder how they even compile. Some will even make you wonder why demons don't leap out the screen. This video was inspired by some research for the previous fourth video I made. Inside the book Starting Forth is this small snippet where they wonder what language a computer might speak, and then reason it probably looks like this. Before deciding a programming language should be easy to understand. Well. As you're about to see, some languages do look like that, and are deliberately hard to understand. Let's warm up with a few of these weird languages, just to get mentally prepared for the terrors that await us. This first one is pretty terrible, in fact I can't speak its name. To do so would incur the wrath of the YouTube gods, and get this video demonetized before I've even finished writing the script. Yes. The first language is brain fog often. We won't stay long here. I have a more interesting video idea for this little language. Created in 1993 by Urban Mueller as an exercise in creating the smallest possible compiler, BF has some interesting features. You see, just as it's quite possible to build an entire computer using nothing more than transistors, it's possible to write a Turing complete programming language using nothing more than eight basic instructions, which are listed here on the screen. Yep, it's mad. Here's the game of life in BF. I can't run it. Every interpreter I've tried it on crashes. We're not done with this language. Hit subscribe to find out when I go for a deep dive into the world of Turing machines and what computers even are. Let's get onto something far, far worse. This next language is named after the eighth level of hell in Dante's Inferno, so fits right in with the theme of this video. Programming is difficult, right? Well, what happens if you try to make it as hard as possible? Well, Ben Olmsted in 1998 had that very thought, and Malbolge was the result. This isn't difficult in the same way BF is difficult. BF is hard because it's so stripped back and basic. No, Malbolge is doing this on purpose. Ever thought the computer hates you and has just been awkward to spite you? Well, what if the creator of your language was out to make your life difficult? What might they do? Well, how about you first start by defining a virtual machine that will execute your code rather than the language itself? Make it based on tri-state logic using things called trits. And make each word 10 trits wide. Then, instead of having instructions to sequence together like a sane language, implement an increasingly complex process. I'll just show it on the screen because I don't understand it and I've read it about four times. Oh, and the code is encrypted. Because why not? Here's Hello World. Probably the most basic code that anyone ever writes in any language. Yeah, let's just leave quietly. Avoid eye contact, I think. We're done with the languages made specifically for hurting us. Go on now, quickly. Isolangs, as they're called, are a whole internet subculture. If we stay here too long, someone will point out another, worse one. Something like Intercal. But we're not going there. Like it or not, Python has become a very useful utility language. Need to make a quick tool? You can have it done in an hour using Python. Feeling lazy? Just describe what you want to chat GPT and it'll give you a decent starting point. Wasn't always like this. In the 90s, before Python was around, everything was written as a big sticky ball of Unix commands. Or, if you wanted to be more organised, Perl. Perl ruled everything, even the web. JavaScript wasn't a thing at the time. PHP wasn't a thing either. If you wanted an interactive website, you wrote the interactive bit using Perl. Perl is incredibly powerful and completely a product of the Unix mindset. That means not only do you need to have read the fine manual, but possibly spent several months reading Usenet posts to even understand what's going on. You also needed to own the O'Reilly Perl book with the camel on. That was required. Perl has many sharp edges, and learning not to cut all your fingers off is part of the learning process. Here's some basic Perl. It looks all right, doesn't it really? variables, basic flow control, some C-like escaping of strings, seems quite tame. 
things start to go a bit askew when we get to things called default operators. And we want to pass arguments into functions. There's no friendly variables here, just an array with indices. And the array doesn't even have a name. The true awesome power, and that's awesome as inspiring awe and fear, is unleashed when we get to regular expressions, or regex, as they're called, to make them sound less intimidating. You see, it's not enough to have a complex scripting language full of visual chaff that's hard to read. It also needs complete text parsing and a replacement engine welding into it as well. I won't spoil regular expressions for you. They're a concept best discovered for yourself. And after discovering them, if you think that they're the solution to your problem, you're wrong. They're not, they will just make it worse. But they do allow you to describe sequences of characters and then manipulate those characters, replacing parts of them with other characters. It's search and replace on steroids built into the language. The early web used to run on this. This was the old internet. Little bobby tables hadn't even been born yet. It was quite acceptable back then to shovel text into a Perl CGI program, run it through a database, and dump the output back at the browser. But this is not a video about the scary early days of the web where nothing was encrypted and HT password files were considered secure. I don't want to thoroughly scare you away. Let's move along though, we're starting to warm up. Let's sprinkle a few honourable mentions in before we dive into the truly terrifying stuff. Also, if you're still watching, drop a like and tell the almighty algorithm people like you might also enjoy this video if they get to see it. You see, in my first job, I had to program industrial hardware. It was a pretty cool job. I got to do more than bash C code into my computer. One of the things I had the unending joy of programming in was something called Isograph. It's a sort of industrial control language. The version we used ran under Windows NT 3.51. It was quite similar to how you program CPLDs and other programmable logic. Also in the office where I worked was a Linux server. I was in charge of making it work. One of its functions was email. In the late 90s, Linux servers that did email ran sendmail. Here's a sendmail config file. Humans wrote this. They claimed they understood what it meant. So much that O'Reilly wrote a book on it. Okay. Now I've waffled on a bit and scared off half the audience, I should be left with the truly curious. Let's get the juicy ones out. Let's start with C. Good old C. I personally think C is the best language around. Not C++, just straight up C. It's infinitely powerful and you can do everything in it. Providing you're careful. If you're not careful, you can rootkit your computer and destroy everything in the blink of an eye. That risk is why C Sharp and Rust exist. Modern CPUs and computers are far too complex. We probably should write secure code that can't go stomping around the whole machine if it pleases. However, if the need takes you, or you're using a microcontroller, C is still the way to go. Now, some enterprising people decided C wasn't hard enough to read and write, and they started a competition to deliberately write what is called obfuscated code. Code deliberately written using any tricks possible to make it impossible to understand. It's like that leak code on your team who thinks they're a rockstar programmer because they know the ternary operator and they think lots of macros is clever. They possibly also claim to understand how C++ templates work. You know the kind I'm talking about. You're probably trying to fix their code at work. If that's not enough, how about some quines? What's a quine? It's a program that when you run it, it prints out a copy of itself. Think about that for a few seconds. How would that even work? Surely somehow it's going to get stuck in a loop of trying to print itself. Well, here's some examples. So programs printing themselves, whatever next. Let's carry on with some C. You've used switch statements before, yes? And I bet you've used do while loops. Uh, sorry, Python programmers. There's an upside down version of a while loop. You don't have it. You do have switch statements now though. It's only taken 20 years. Welcome to the 1980s. Well, what happens if you mash do while loops and switch statements together? You get this thing. Yep, that's a thing. And it compiles and it reveals some interesting things about how switch statements in C turn into assembly. Look, 
here's how it appears as assembly and C. You can kind of see what's going on. You know how we're taught GoTo is evil in BASIC? Well, labels and GoTo's exist in C as well. I think behind the scenes, C's GoTo and switch statements are very similar. I'm fairly sure break and continue are just GoTo in a more socially acceptable way. It's quite interesting, isn't it, really? So there we go. I hope you found that kind of fun. It's quite interesting researching all these different random languages and the pure abuse that us programmers can cause to our computers. I want to leave you with two more though, because I hope you also enjoy seeing just how writing code can sometimes be a bit like magic. We type stuff in the keyboard that doesn't make any sense to human beings normally. We sit there and think about it, and then this box just kind of springs to life and does its own thing. Well, it kind of makes sense to us when you get used to it. But here's some uh, actual real weird examples. Before Elon broke Twitter, or at least helped Twitter on its way out, there was a fun bot on there called the BBC Microbot. Some of you might have encountered it. It's now moved to Mastodon, and you can interact with it there. The idea is, if you've not seen it, you can send it a message with some BBC basic code in. It then executes that code and returns an animated GIF of the output. People got quite inventive with it but soon discovered Twitter's message limit was a problem. They couldn't write long programs. Well, it's only a problem if you're typing out human readable text. You see, BBC Basic gets turned into tokens, and by design, each token is an 8-bit value. You know what else is also an 8-bit value? UTF-8 and most of Unicode. The BBC Microbot has a direct one-to-one -one mapping between printable 8-bit Unicode characters and BBC Basic tokens. That leads to this truly cursed output travelling across the internet, a bit like the aliens from Independence Day using the satellite signals. Just look at this stuff. You cannot understand anything about what's going on here. But it is valid code that the BBC Microbot can even understand. If that's not cursed enough, the URLs for these programmes contain the programme itself as escaped UTF-8 characters. It's bonkers. Now, for some final fun, I'm going to leave you with this language I discovered by accident. It's called emoji code. You see, I recently discovered that in some languages that understand Unicode in their source code, you can use emojis as variable names. Well, emoji code goes even further. Here's its website to explain. It's weird and quite fun. You use little emojis as the language itself. So, I'm off now. It's trick or treat night. I'm going to hide in my front room with the lights off, avoiding the kids that will demand sweets in exchange for not letting my car tires down. So I'll see you next time.